You're listening to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. Welcome everyone to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey, and my guest today is Dr. Luke Swiston. He's one of our board certified plastic surgeons here at La Jolla Cosmetic. Welcome, Dr. Swiston. Thank you, Monique. Nice to be here. So today we're just going to kind of get to know you. How long have you been a part of our dream team here at La Jolla Cosmetic? Well, I've been uh, operating here since January 2021, so almost a year now. I've been in contact with the clinic for a couple of months prior to that. It's been the most wonderful year of my life so far. I, I can't lie about that. <laughs> prior to that, I lived in Los Angeles for about three years. I was finishing out my plastic surgery training and fellowship in Beverly Hills in aesthetic plastic surgery, and then working for two different practices over in Los Angeles and in Beverly Hills, just to kind of get my feet wet, I suppose but just couldn't stay away from San Diego. <laughs> so how did you land here? You want to tell everybody, you and I have a secret. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes. So a long time ago, probably about three years ago now, I finished the board certification process for plastic surgery and I got my diploma you know, as a board certified plastic surgeon. And I went ahead and posted that on Instagram. And we were already following each other on Instagram casually, just without any significant contact beyond that. And after I posted my diploma, picture, Monique said, congratulations. And I said, thank you. And then I also said something like, oh, and by the way, if you're ever looking for any help in San Diego, let me know because I'd love to live down there. And Monique said, oh, really? Well, as a matter of fact, (laughs) we might because one of our surgeons is retiring and uh, the conversation started there. So I can say that I got this job through Instagram, which I think is kind of not not common, but (laughs) yeah. Very serendipitous in this case. Yeah, it really was. It was kind of a cool conversation to go from being in your DMs and (laughs) giving you congratulations to you in the OR down the hall, which I love. So tell us about what procedures you love to do and why. I like to do big body transformation procedures, you know, things that kind of strike you as far as differences from across the street, from across the beach. So the very common one is basically, you know, liposuction fat transfer, also known as Brazilian butt lift. One of those where, uh, you know, a patient comes in and maybe doesn't have the curves or the shape that she wants. And then after the procedure and after her healing process, it's a completely different person. And there's a lot of uh, photos of that those very successful results that a lot of people don't even believe me that it's the same person until I point out the tattoos and they're like, oh, wow, it is the same person. Uh, But I think that's the most satisfying outcome. Surprisingly common feedback that I've gotten from these patients is like, I live life differently now. I'm so much more confident and so much more outgoing. And it's a huge mental shift in addition to to the physical transformation that we made, but it makes a, a big difference in their lives. The second most common surgery that I do is actually uh, has to do with breast implants. And there's lots of patients that have breast implants and do really, really well with them. But there's a small subset of patients who don't tolerate them very well. And what I do is I actually, a lot of times will remove the implant and maybe all the scar tissue that's associated with the implant and find an aesthetic solution that is acceptable to the patient that does not involve implants. And that that can be a very big challenge at times, as you can imagine, but we have lots of different uh, techniques to to do that. And that's been a very large part of my practice as well. So what can patients expect when they come to see you for the first time? A long conversation. (laughs) In order for me to find out what the patient wants, I really need to spend the time with them to, to hear them out. And then we usually discuss a lot of options available and uh, I let them basically lead me in the direction of what they are looking for. And uh, then we discuss the pros and cons of their choice and so on and so forth. So it's typically a long consult for the body contouring procedures. A lot of times we'll use a Vectra analysis as well, which is the technology that we have in the office where we do a three-dimensional scan of the patient's body and we can manipulate the body curves right on the screen with the patient giving us feedback right there and then. So it's a really great tool for us to communicate about the result that they're looking for. And it helps me be in their head when they're asleep on the operating table and I'm doing the procedure. Oh, interesting. So tell us a little bit about your educational path and where you trained. I was born in Poland, but I lived in Chicago most of my life. And most of my training is from Chicago. It was uh, University of Chicago as undergrad and then University of Illinois for medical school. 
And then after that, I went ahead and joined the Navy and subsequently started, you know, did a one year internship in general surgery at Naval Medical Center San Diego. And that was back in 2004. And that's how my wife and I fell in love with San Diego, basically. That's when we discovered it. We lived here for five years. After my internship, I was active duty military with the Navy and I was assigned to two different Marine battalions and, you know, with two deployments to Iraq and stuff. But the five years we spent in San Diego while this was happening was pretty much the best time of our lives. So after the active duty obligations were over, I went back into training. So I went back to Chicago for general surgery and then uh, ended up in Salt Lake City and the University of Utah for plastic surgery training. And by that time, I was pretty sure that uh, I wanted to gear my mindset, my practice towards aesthetics. Interestingly enough, my undergrad degree was actually in visual arts. And I think it took me about 10 years to figure out that marrying plastic surgery with visual arts was sort of my best forte, my best, you know, the best combination of, I think, I guess my skill set and my mindset. But to that end, I went uh, to train for one more year to Beverly Hills. And that's where I did an aesthetic fellowship with uh, lots of plastic surgeries geared specifically towards the aesthetic outcomes, as opposed to reconstructive and hand and craniofacial, which is, you know, something that I've done in my training before. After that, I, you know, my wife and I, to settle down in Los Angeles for a couple of years just to see how we like it. I think uh, at the time we were of a mindset that uh, Southern California is Southern California. So LA probably is just as good as San Diego and uh, why not give it a try? But we quickly the found out horror, that <laughs> horror of that sentence from a that, San Diego native. Yes. Ears. <laughs> um, well, again, it took us a little bit of time to figure it out. Okay, uh, you came to but, the right place. But uh, you know, because we were used to big cities before. I lived downtown Chicago for a long time when I trained, and and that was its own thing. But again, we we just came to the conclusion that San Diego was really the best place that we've ever lived in, and. Uh, pretty quickly after having spent some time in Los Angeles and getting stuck in traffic and just just the in- inaccessibility of of the valley to just general daily life and stuff like that, we quickly tried to start devising a plan how to get back to San Diego. And at first, it was more like a remote dream, like, well, maybe we'll just retire there. And then we decided, no, life is too short. Let's actually just actively figure out a way to get there. And that's when uh, the Instagram event happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. Again, You know, that was actually, so I have to confess that I, you know, we had our little conversation in the DMs and you offered help. And so I kind of went and stalked you a little bit on Instagram and went through your feed. And that visual arts, to me, that really resonated. I didn't know that about you at the time, but as I scrolled through, I'm looking at before and after pictures. I'm looking at beautifully shot photography that you did, but then I also saw your drawings. You had some hand drawings that kind of represented change in body shape, but that really spoke to me. And I thought, you know, our founder, Dr. Merle Olison, he used to do drawings before we had computer imaging, where he would do a life-size black and white, put a piece of thin tracing paper over and draw for the patient so they could see the difference in their face or their nose or profile. And so I immediately thought, wow, you know, there's somebody who has this very artistic eye who is also seemingly an amazing surgeon based on these before and afters. So yeah, so it's interesting that that's actually how I took notes in <laughs> a oh, lot really? of the fellowship. Yeah, those are cases instead of just writing everything down, a lot of times it was just a lot easier for my head to express it in the drawing. So all those drawings that you've seen posted on on Instagram early on were basically from different cases that I've done in my aesthetic surgery fellowship that helped me visualize and think about how to do certain procedures and how to approach certain procedures. So there's there's a lot less writing and a lot more drawing in those. Mm. And I think it just worked for me. So now, was there ever a moment where you thought, okay, I want to be a doctor? Was that when you were a child or somewhere uh, in the middle of Fallujah or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was much earlier on. I think probably sometime in college, you know, just having no, known some doctors and some surgeons and how, you know, they use their skill set, the dexterity of the hands and just making changes in people's lives. I thought doctor, maybe surgeon, but I also thought artist, maybe photographer. And I kind of wanted to be a pilot, but somebody told me since my eyes weren't perfect, I can't do that. So I sort of abandoned that. Not necessarily true, by the way. If you ever want to be a pilot, somebody tells you your eyes are bad, you can still be a pilot. So don't kill that dream. Well, I mean, (laughs) being a surgeon, you need good eyes too. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, true. But I think it materialized 
probably like end of high school before college. And uh, because I did end up, you know, using at the time when I was an undergrad, my major again was in visual arts, period, the end. I did not have a minor in anything else, but I did do my pre-medical prerequisites just in case. I literally said like, well, if I want to be a doctor, this needs to be done, which wasn't easy, but it was done. And as life was evolving and I as, as I shadowed more doctors and surgeons in undergrad and after that, I decided that, you know, medical school is the way to go. So you mentioned that you grew up in Poland. So tell us about that journey from Poland to here. Well, I was born in Poland and I came to the States when I was 11. So I I lived in Poland for about 10 and a half, 11 years in one city called Opola, which is in the southern part closer to the mountains. It was very different. This is at the time, you know, like late 70s, early 80s, when Poland was still under communist rule. So there was a lot of you know, very, very different structure in government. And I think my dad was the first one to really want to try to break away from that because he wanted to be an entrepreneur and that was just not possible under that system. Mm -hmm. So because we had family in the United States, he went ahead and emigrated out. And then about three years later is when the decision was made by my family on my behalf to go ahead and move the whole family to, to America just because the situation was just so much better at the time. And that's what we did. We went through the whole visa process, obtaining the visa. And I remember actually going to get a visa at one point when we got rejected. And if you get rejected, you have to wait another year for to apply for the visa again. So I remember that happening once or twice. And, you know, everybody was in tears when that happened. But eventually we went, you know, we, we actually got the visa. We came over and then we got the green cards. And that's another story in and of itself. But yeah. we did it the right way and the time consuming but correct pathways. And so eventually we got citizenship for the entire family, which allowed me to actually join the military and as an officer afterwards. That's wonderful. What were your first impressions of America when you got here? Well, everybody in Poland has an incredibly skewed, at the time at least when I was uh, growing up there, they had an incredibly positive skewed vision of what America is like. It's just everybody likes the country. Everybody tries to associate with the country. American TV and American music videos was the the hit thing at the time. And everybody tried to imitate that. So for me to be going to America was great. I arrived to a house that my dad built. He's a, you know, he's a general contractor. He owns a little business in uh, construction, but he built our own house. It was a very small house. But to me, there's all these things that were new that I've never seen before. I think, you know, because he just built it, it was a fresh, very thick carpet that I remember that was the thing that stood out the most is that I've never seen a carpet like that before you can almost swim in it it was amazing (laughs) so for an 11 year old to just be stepping on the carpet that you're sinking into it was like oh my god this is America (laughs) Uh, and then like everything was new and fresh and smelled nice and it was a very positive experience even though looking back it's like well it was a tiny little house in the middle of nowhere you know (laughs) barely anything but that's not how I read it that's the beauty of kids, you know, kids, mm-hmm. we get jaded, I think, as we get older in that when you have that fresh perspective and, and you've got children. So isn't it fun to kind of see things through their eyes as a dad now? Yes, it's very interesting. And my my kids grew up, I have I've kind of a wide gamut of ages of kids. My oldest one is 14 and my youngest one is three. But we were living in very different places when the 14-year-old was very young and growing up. And we have, you know, a little bit more space and stability now since we've moved here. But it doesn't really seem to affect the kids. I think they're going to be happy anywhere as long as you provide a nice nurturing home and environment. And I remember, I think that was my experience as well. Now, what do you like to do outside of the office? Where could we find you Saturday morning? Well, since I have three kids, like we mentioned, Saturday morning is probably the time that my wife will be sleeping in and I'll be responding to the three-year-old, you know, saying that he wants to get out of the crib. (laughs) So I'll try to make some coffee or he'll make coffee with me. That's the traditional. Every one of my sons, for some reason, wants to make coffee with me on Saturday morning. (laughs) It's an activity. And then the the first two grew out of it already, but now the third one took over. And, uh, you know, we just, we just do family stuff for now, uh, right now, um, just because of how involved we are with the, with the kids on my own. My, my big hobby was actually, you know, just driving. I have a tiny little sports car that I've had for the last 16 years that was a hobby of mine, but now my 14 year old is starting to take a lot of interest in that and, and a lot of interest in cars. So we kind of go to car shows and little car events here and there. So 
we have found common ground. I'm actually proud to say I've taught him how to drive stick shift, even though he's only 14. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so, and he was very excited about that. Yeah, um, he was. So he's considered that, considers that kind of something to be proud of. So our goal is for can him you, to. Can you teach me next? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we got, we got a couple cars that can do that. <laughs> we got two cars. I know. I want to be a race car driver, but I don't know how to drive a stick. This is, yeah. this is the problem over here. <laughs> well, you don't need to for the race car driving is very different nowadays. Push the but, buttons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember you telling me, because you moved into your house here and you were talking about your garden and having your son design your garden. Yeah, so our backyard, we bought a house which was fairly plain as far as the backyard goes. Uh, there's just a little bit of a concrete space and some bushes and not much else. And we have a, you know, my, my son is expressing a little bit of interest in architecture. So that's the project that I sort of gave him is let's see if we can design something for this backyard that is congruent with the continuity of the house and something that maybe we'll build in the next 10 or 15 years. So that's a project that he's kind of working on right now. And this is the three-year-old, this, right? No, I'm sorry. This is the 14-year-old. Kidding. <laughs> 14-year-old. So how's that going? Is it uh, it's good. going well? Yeah. yeah, he's got a couple of different versions depending on, you know, there's one that I like more and then there's another one that mom likes more oh. depending on the layout. But uh, yeah, he's, he's you're very good at it. He's thinking of doing this for real, like in school. So, so we'll see yeah. what happens. So what have you learned from listening to patients over the years? I think the patients are basically the most, by far the most important teaching experiences that you'll have in your life as a doctor. And that never ends. Uh, you'll learn until you retire. And even after you retire, you still learn, I think. Uh, and I have a lot more, a lot of respect for surgeons who are in their 30th year of practice who still listen to patients and still modify their techniques, especially in surgery. So I guess uh, once you know the basics from medical school and from, you know, the training in residencies, I think the patients will fine tune your skills. If you just listen to them, they will tell you what they want and they will tell you how to do things better than what you've, you've ever done. You just have to keep your mind open. I think that's true in a lot of different professions The people who do it for a long time have to always be, remain open to all the things that have changed and progressed since then. Mm-hmm. That's why you guys do a lot of training. So you get your board certification, you get your pretty thing to put up on the wall. But after that, what are the requirements for ongoing medical education? So in order to get that diploma in the first place, there's years and years of training. So once you get that diploma, you're in your late 30s, early 40s. In my case, it was early 40s. And that's when you start looking for your actual job. To maintain your certification, yes, you have to take a test annually that is uh, devised by the board. The old way of doing it was that you have to recertify every 10 years. So every 10 years, you take a huge, huge test that takes like all day, but they've changed it now to where we just take a kind of a smaller test, but every year that sort of adds up to that 10-year test. And on top of that, we have to uh, also prove that we're staying on top of our training. So there is uh, every year to keep your medical license, you have to uh, submit proof that you've attended so many lectures throughout the year that have to do with patient safety and your skill set and your profession. So we can find you on ljcsc.com. And then you said on Instagram at... At Swiston MD. And then what would you like listeners to take away from this podcast? I think more than anything, especially in aesthetic plastic surgery, I've learned that communication is key with patients. So we're going to go over exactly what you're looking for in your result and then exactly the options that you have and the pros and cons of each option. And then uh, we're going to make a collective and informed decision on how to proceed after surgery. But I mean, I can't do something that I don't have a clear understanding that the patient really, really desires for the right reasons. And that's that's sort of the connection we try to build. It's interesting that you mentioned the reviews. I, I, I actually, you know, I know that that's the reality of today is people go to reviews first and foremost. And I think I still have 5.0 stars, which I can only go down from there. But, <laughs> but uh, just one person to give you a four. <laughs> yeah, but but they're uh, but they're telling because the, each one of these patients just spent a lot of time on these reviews. I was very blown away by that. Just seeing that, like, oh my god, there's like three or four paragraphs about like what you know how this patient feels about what happened. But I think they're very genuine and uh, mm-hmm. and very telling. Okay, well, this was fun. 
I hope you had I hope you had a good time. Thanks for spending time with me and for everybody listening. If you have any questions about our services or want to schedule a consultation with Dr. Swiston, just let us know. Check out the show notes. We've got all the links and we will see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetic. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego Freeway in the Zymed building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.